as you gospel. The idea comes from the concept of Matthew 28. As you go into the world, make disciples. As you go, gospel. And for the next several weeks, we're going to be focusing on what this means to, to go and, and be Jesus to the world around us, to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his voice. And it's not just going to be a, a theme or, or, or a sermon series. It's, it's the setting, the stage for our future as a church and who we're going to be and how we're going to do ministry. You know, it's hard to believe, but I've been the pastor now for two and a half years. Uh, just past two and a half years. I, I kind of woke up the other day and went, wow, two and a half years. It has flown. Now, for some of you, you're probably going, no, it's not. No, it, it has flown by, and, and I'm amazed. And, and my wife and I were talking about it. We feel so blessed to be here. We love you. We love this church. We love what God is doing and how God is moving and where he has us headed as a church into the future. I, I, I cannot believe just how blessed and how fulfilled I am as a pastor and just, just so grateful for each of you. Thank you for how you minister to my family. Uh, thank you for how you pour your lives into our lives. Thanks for partnering with us. And I look over here and, and there's several people on, on staff sitting over here. This is kind of the staff corner. If you're over, unless you're, unless you're over here with, with students. And so there, we, we got you surrounded, okay, as a staff. But just so grateful to be here and, and for what God is doing. Uh, when I was in Birmingham a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago for a pastor's conference, the, the question was asked to me, so what's the first two and a half years been like? And what's going on? And, and how would you describe it? And I, and I said, well, let me think about this. I would call it patient transition. And, and, and I went on to explain, you know, when I got here, this church, has, this church is filled with remarkable people, really. Some of you are just, I'm blown away at how God is moving in your life. I'm so thankful for your commitment to, to the work of the Lord in this church. I'm, I, I can't begin to tell you how, how blessed our church is with some of our lay leaders and all that they do. Some of our deacons, most of our deacons, if not all of our deacons, and how they serve. It, it is, is really amazing how blessed this church is with quality, godly people. But yet the reality is when I got here, the church was hurting. The church had gone through a difficult time, a very difficult stretch. And I, I came in and, and I, my, my first thing was, you know what, I, I want to... I want to get to know the people. I want to get to know the heart of the church. I, and little did I know that when I got here that we would also, as we're going through really kind of a healing time, that we'd also begin the process of a staff transition. And with the hiring of Mark to come be our missions pastor, uh, I have been searching for staff since day one, two and a half years of staff searching. I, I feel like I've gotten like 10 to 15 hours of my life back just in the last two weeks. It's, but we've been through so much, you know, because when a staff member leaves, not only do you have people that we're close to leave and we hurt because of that, but then you have the process of, of, of an interim and then you have the process of helping break a new staff member in to get to know them. And so it's, it's, it's a time of, of change, of, tra of transition. Uh, another thing that I thought about was the, how I really felt coming in that the two things that we really need to focus on was the clear teaching of the Word of God, and then secondly, making sure that we're focused on the world around us in missions, whether it's in our community or whether it's around the world. And, and I'm so thankful for, for how, not just how you responded, but how our small group leaders how many of them responded. And I, I, I believe that we are, we are better at teaching God's word accurately. We were, we were good to begin with, but I think we're even better from the pulpit all the way down to the smallest of groups. And then the number of people that are said, you know what, we'll go. We have several people that have gone. I, I know that, that Brittany's getting ready to go to Kenya. And uh, Alan, you guys have how many people going to Charm? 22 people going here just in a couple of weeks, and Canada's coming up. We've got 20 or so people going to Canada. People willing to engage in the world around us. And all of these have been part of a transition. 
Which brings me to where we are now. I've had a number of people say, okay, pastor, where are we going? What's the vision? And to be honest with you, I hate the word vision because I don't think vision is more important than mission. And so as we begin over the next several weeks to lay out a picture of what I believe God is calling us to do, I, I want to kind of set the ground rules and kind of give you a base understanding. First of all, I want to look at three words, words that, that we all hear on a regular basis that I want to make sure we're clear upon. And I share this with you because I think it's critical from me to you, to you. So we, we got same terms, but we're, we're all on the same page. I read a quote this week from a friend who's a pastor down in, in Mobile. And when I read it, it really clicked with me. It clicked to what I'm getting ready to share with you. He wrote, as a pastor, my job is not to preserve the organization or grow the church. My job is to glorify Christ by being faithful and being obedient. And I believe that with all my heart. I didn't ride in on a white horse, and if God takes me out, I don't, plan, I don't think I'm riding out on a white horse. I didn't come to be the Savior of the church. We already have a Savior. His name's Jesus. And aren't you thankful for that? And so as I come to you today, I, I want to be clear of, and, and to be honest with you, humble to the fact that I'm privileged to serve alongside of you. But I also understand my responsibility to sit in the seat that I do under God to give direction to our church. So with that, three words. First word, mission. What is mission? Mission is our purpose. It's why we exist. Now here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is we don't get to set the mission. God's already done that. The mission was set when, when he looked at his disciples and said, go into all the world and make, nation, make, make disciples of all the nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't get to monkey with that. That is our call. Now, here's the bad news. We don't get to monkey with it. We just have to decide whether or not we're going to do it. And so as we come to a church, you know, it's funny, every church has a mission statement, and, and every church is different. They'll have similar statements, but they're all based around the same thing. Are we going to go into the world? Are we going to make disciples of all nations by teaching people, by leading them to Christ and teaching them to grow up in their faith so they can go out and be Jesus to the world? And so ours, if you open your bulletin, it, it, it says that we exist to, to help all people experience an authentic and meaningful relationship with Christ and one another. That's all about this. How do we do that? We want everyone to honor God. How? By connecting with Christ through a personal relationship and connecting with local body believers so they can grow up in their faith, so they can go out and be Jesus to the world. That's why we exist. And it lines up with the Great Commission. We could have a thousand different statements, but all of them are going to center around the Great Commission. And so that's where we start. God defined it. We've got to decide whether we're going to be obedient to it or not. The second word. This is a word that I think gets a little too much press. It's the word vision. Vision. What is vision? I believe that vision is a picture of what the mission looks like when it's accomplished or when it's in process. It's nothing more than a picture. I think in our society today, we make more of vision than we do of the mission. And I would even submit to you that most, what most people are looking for when you talk about vision is they're looking for the third word. They're looking for the, for the word strategy. How are we going to accomplish the mission. Now, here's the good news. The good news is, is Jesus has given us our mission. He's given us our purpose. What is our job? Our job as a staff, our job working with our deacons, with our lay leadership, is to interpret how do we accomplish that in Peachtree City, Georgia? How do we accomplish it from, from this location? See, I believe that the church, if, if we had to change it, I would change our church instead of to First Baptist Church to First Baptist Mission Post. Because what we are, we're, we're, yes, we're a place to gather, but we're also a place to scatter. And our calling is not to have four of us and no more people. Our calling is to go out into the world and be Jesus to the world around us. And so when we come here, it should be to fellowship, to encounter, to encourage. But then when we leave, we're all on mission. We're all going to be the hands, the feet, and the voice of Christ to the world around us. And this, this responsibility is incumbent upon us based upon the Great Commission. Go into the world. He's talking to the disciples. Go into the world. You are a disciple. I'm a disciple. How are we going? How are we gospeling as we go? 
And so we, we need to ask, what is the mission to make disciples of all nations? What's the vision? The vision is the picture of what it looks like when we're doing it well. And then third, what is the strategy? Over the next several weeks, I want to begin to unfold what I believe is the strategy God has laid upon my heart, laid upon our leadership's heart of how we can accurately do this. Today, though, before we get started, I want to lay the biblical foundation. I want to share with you why I feel so convicted about this. Now, there's a second thing I want to share with you, not just those words, but why now? Why two and a half years into it? Why didn't we do this two years ago? To be honest with you, because I don't believe that we were ready two years ago. I believe we were still hurting. I believe that we did not have the staff to accomplish it. We had staff that were, were hurting. Some of them felt like they needed to leave. Some of them felt like God was leading them somewhere else. We weren't in a position to accomplish the mission, the, the vision that God was given us. And so we've had to wait. I think a second reason is because we needed not just to heal, but we needed to, to hunger. We needed to get to the place where we're saying, okay, God, what is it you have for us? And I've waited. I've waited for people in our church, key leaders in our church, to come up and say, okay, where are we going to do? Where are we headed? I don't know if you've ever found this to be true or not, but what I've discovered is if I go to my wife and my kids and I say, here, this is what's going to happen, they generally don't receive it as well as when they come up and say, hey, what are we going to do? And if they say, what are we going to do? And I begin to say, oh, okay, they're much more receptive. I've been waiting for a lot of our key leaders and a lot of our church members come and say, okay, pastor, where are we headed? What is it you want us to do? And that has crescendoed to a place where I believe that we can now respond. And then third, we now have a team here to help make it happen. And so we've been waiting for God and waiting for this. And then the third thing goes to Proverbs 28, 19, 29, 18. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, this passage of scripture, the word vision there, it doesn't mean vision that we make up. Rather, it means where there is no word from the Lord, the people perish. We have been waiting for God to speak. You know, we were just singing a song, we won't move without you. We won't move without you. I believe with all my heart that Christian life is knowing God, hearing his voice, so that you can do what he tells you to do. I've been praying, I've been seeking, I've been learning, I've been growing, I've been wading through, struggling through, I've been working with our staff, I've been working with other people, trying to make sure that, that we have a clear word from God on the future of our church. And here's the good news. God's not finished with us yet. Aren't you glad of that? This is a, this is a mission outpost, not a morgue. And I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited about how God's leading. And I hope that over the next couple of weeks, as we begin to unfold this and we begin to lay out the picture, the strategy, that it will excite you, that it will invigorate you, that it will cause you to step up and say, you know what, I'm ready to be a part of this. I'm ready to re-engage for some of you because it's been a while. For others who are new to our church, you're like going, all right, this is great, let's go. And we're gonna begin that process of unfolding and doing the vision, doing the, accomplishing the mission. I do want to stress to you that until Christ returns, we're in a journey. We're not at a destination. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but God has this tendency not to say, okay, here's the complete picture. I'm not giving you a complete picture because God's not given us a complete picture. What God has given us is a place to begin and it's, a, and it's clear to get us on the road. We will, be, we, will, we will be able to go far into the journey, but we have to wait on the Lord and trust him for whatever step is next in the process. With that said, let's pray, and then we'll jump into this. Father, we ask for your understanding. We ask for your insight. We ask for your clarity. Lord, today, as we lay out the biblical foundations, we lay out the word that you have given us, may we have understanding Speak to us, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. In Mark chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, there are two parables. We're going to focus on the second parable, but we will refer to the first parable because it's important to understanding the second. But in Mark chapter 4, verse 26, we find this passage, Jesus speaking. He says, the kingdom 
This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel of the head, in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now, before we dive into this passage, we need to go back and look at the parable in front of this. In verse 1, we have what's called the parable of the sower. This parable is also found in Matthew chapter 13, which is one of the great passages where Jesus shares many, many parables. But this parable is, is really a cornerstone parable to understanding God's heart, but also understanding who we are and how God is trying to speak to us in our daily lives. The parable goes like this. A man... Has, a farmer has seed, and he throws seed out into the world. And the seed lands upon four types of surfaces, four types of heart. It, 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 it falls on a surface heart. That's a heart that's trampled down, a trampled down path. And it says that a bird comes by and steals the seed. Then there's a shallow heart, the heart that's on the rocky ground. And it's not necessarily rocks, but rather it was the, the way that's described in Scripture is that there was about three inches of soil and then bedrock underneath it. So you couldn't get down, didn't have the ability to germinate. And when the sun comes up, it scorches the seed and the seed dies. The third is the strangled heart. It's a seed that falls among the thorns and the thistles, and as it begins to grow, the, the, the weeds around it choke it off, and, and it prevents it. And then last is the surrendered heart. This is a heart that's fertile. The ground is broken up. It's not fallow ground. It's fertile ground, and when the seed hits, it germinates and grows. And so we see in this passage, Jesus explains. He says that the Father, God the Father, is the farmer. And he takes the seed. The seed is the gospel. It's the word of God. And, this, and Jesus has thrown the gospel into all the world. The truth that Jesus died on the cross. He died, paid for everyone's sin. And that whoever would come to him would not perish but have eternal life. It's about not just the, the, the gospel. It's not just about God dying on the cross for us. But it's also the teachings of Christ of how we live an earthly life that, earthly life that honors him. And so here we have this gospel that the Father has thrown out. And it's fallen upon four types of hearts. It's fallen upon a heart that's, that's trampled down. It's a, it's a surface heart. And as soon as it hits, Satan, the bird, comes and steals the seed. And that, that person never receives the gospel. They hear it. They may even experience it. But it never takes root. And as a result, they have no relationship with God. The second, the second one is this shallow heart. The seed falls, but it can't germinate. The, 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 the world comes up. The, the life, life hits it and its seed is, is burnt up and, and, and it dies. And that, the word rocky ground there is referring to us having hard hearts because life has brought hardness to us. And then you have the third one, which is the strangled, which is reference to the world. The seed falls into the world. Have you ever noticed how many different messages and how many, how many mixed signals we get from the world? We, we're taught every day somehow that whether it's through ecumenicalism, whether it's through universalism, we're taught all roads lead to heaven. Folks, all roads don't lead to heaven. There's only one road that leads to heaven. And Jesus says, I'm the only way, the only truth, the only life. No man comes to the Father but through me. It's not God being narrow-minded. It's God providing a way of escape from sin and the condemnation of sin. It's not, it's not God saying, oh, the, the, I, I want to just exclude everybody. No, God's trying to ex include everyone. So he's provided a means for people to be rescued, to be saved. It's an incredible gift that God has given us. And yet... So many people, they hear these other messages and they buy into every message but the message of the gospel, the message of God's love. As a result, that message gets squeezed out, strangled. And then the fourth is the surrendered heart. This is that fertile ground that receives the word and it, and it takes root, and it grows. And this is the person who has genuine faith. Now, when Jesus shared this parable, he was sharing it with a crowd of people that were very religious. And so it's very possible that in, every, in this room right now, there's some of you that you have a surface heart. There's some of you that have a shallow heart. There's some of you who have a, a strangled heart. And there's some of you who have a surrendered heart. It doesn't matter which heart you have. What matters is, is that Jesus died so that your heart could be rescued. He died for you so that you would receive from him. We also learn in this passage of Scripture, going back to that idea that what's, what's Christianity, it's knowing God, hearing his voice, so you can do what he tells you to do. We also find the competing voices in this world. 
See, there are four voices that, that are constantly bombarding our lives. If you look at Matthew, 35 times in Matthew, and as he explains the parable and explains and, and, and gives, the, gives the parable and explains it, he used the word ears, listen, and hear. And I believe it's a reference to the fact that each one of us, we have competing voices for our lives. See, there's not just the voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit, but we also have the voice of Satan that comes in temptation. And every one of us, we understand temptation. We've been tempted. That Satan whispering in our ears, he's trying to get us to go in the opposite direction of God's heart. But then we also have the voice of self, our flesh. It's, it, we're, we're born depraved. We're born sinful. And our flesh has desires that are contrary to the heart and the will of God. That's the reason we're fallen. And sometimes our desires take us away from God's will and God's voice. And then you have the voice of society. Whether it's, and I, I love this phrase, I've used it a million times, from, from, uh, from Madison Avenue to the Rodeo Drive and Main Street in between, we're constantly hit with different ideas, different philosophies, different concepts that are a competing voice to the voice of God in our hearts. Now, why is this important to know in light of this second parable? Because this parable tells us about God's heart. It tells us about how much God loves us. It talks about the condition of our lives. It, 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 it puts a mirror up and says, is your heart shallow? Is your heart, is your heart uh, a surface heart? Is it, is it strangled or is it surrendered? And it causes us to look and not just see who we are, but to see who God is and how much he loves us. Because it's in light of this, when we come to the second parable, it gives us our commission. Let's read it again. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. He doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full, kern full, kern full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Notice there's a man. Who is this man? See, in the first parable, it was God. Is it God in the second parable? I don't think it is. Look what it says. It says that this guy, he doesn't know how it grows. He doesn't understand it all. I don't know about you, but the creator of the universe, he understands he puts a seed in the ground how it works. I believe that this person is us. It's you and me. It's those who call themselves followers of Christ, disciples. And the reason I say that is because look what's in their hand. The seed, the gospel, the same gospel that was being thrown out by the Father has now been placed in our hands. See, he's entrusted us with the gospel, even so we speak not to please men, but God who knows our hearts. And so God has entrusted to us this ministry of reconciliation. He calls us to be ambassadors of Christ. We're called now to throw the seed of the gospel into the world so that people can hear about the love of God and experience him. And he gives us this amazing picture of how it happens. Now, just to, be, just to be clear, let's go back and hit a couple of things. First is the commission. What is our commission? According to the scripture, is to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that people have been commanded, and then helping them to re-engage in doing the same thing over and over and over. What that means is that we are disciples. If you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you are a disciple. You are a follower of Christ. And because of that, you have been given this remarkable commission of going into the world and making disciples of all nations. But here's the problem. Here's the challenge we face. People are messed up. I'm telling you, people's lives are in shambles. And so when you say, you know what, I'm going to go into the world and make disciples, what you're saying is, I'm willing to get my hands dirty. I'm willing to take my clean hands and stick them into the goop of someone else's life in order to help them discover the love of God. Over and over and over, we find people's lives who are messed up. And so what happens in too many churches, what happens among too many Christians is we go, you know what, I got my hands clean. I don't want to get my hands dirty. And so we're not willing to go anywhere. 
We're not willing to touch people. We're not willing to speak to people. Last week when I was driving to Houston, I saw this woman. I, I'm sure, I'm not sure if it was her or she was concerned about it. She had a mask over her face and she was wearing latex gloves walking through the airport. And I thought, what a picture of too many Christians. We've covered our hands because we don't want to get them dirty and we put a mask over because we don't want to bring in the stench, breathe in the stench of humanity or speak the word of grace to them. What a picture. And so we come and we look at this and we're going, God, what is it? Now, here's the good news. Salvation is a miracle of God. I'm not responsible for convicting, convincing, or converting. That's the Holy Spirit's job. What I'm responsible is when the love of God compels me to convey the message of Christ to them. Every one of us have that responsibility if we are truly followers of Christ. The question is, are we willing to get our hands dirty? I don't know how many of you have ever traveled overseas or gone to museums. I, I remember one time I went to Amsterdam, and I, I was told you had to go to this one museum because Rembrandt's Night Watch was there. And I went in, and I'm telling you, it's a massive picture. It's an incredible picture. I stood there, and I did that, what you see where people just sit there and look at something for hours. I sat there probably 30, 45 minutes just staring, trying to pick out the detail. It was an amazing thing. His ability was extraordinary. What, we, what do you think would have happened if when I left, I went back and I went down the back alleyway and all of a sudden I saw this tapestry, this, this painting, and it was now ripped up and it had mud all over it. And, it was, and I went over and I opened and it was... That it was night watch. Can you imagine? What would you do if you found a Rembrandt, an original Rembrandt covered in mud and torn and ripped? What would you do? Would you leave it there? Would you discard it? Or would you pick it up and take it to someone that you knew had the ability to clean it up and restore this priceless work of art? What would you do? I think this is the heart of the gospel because there is no greater work in all of creation than a man or woman, a person created in the image of God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, in, in, the, book of, in the book of Ephesians, it says that we are his workmanship. We're the creative genius, the creative artwork of God. What do we do with the artwork of people whose lives are torn up, whose lives are, are filthy and dirty? Do we just walk by them and say, you know what, they get what they deserve? Or, or you know what, I, I don't want to get my hands dirty. They stink. What do we do with this priceless work of art of another soul? Do we care? And I think that is the challenge that we face. God has given us a clear commission. He has said, this is your mission. And the question is, are we willing to get our hands dirty? Are we willing to take these broken people, some maybe in this room today, and take them to the one who can renew them, the one who can change them, the one who can clean them up and make them once again a priceless work of art? To do that, it requires that we get our hands dirty. And that brings us back to this passage of Scripture. Because this is our calling, the parable of the growing seed. And what I want to do today is, is, is explain the biblical basis of it. And then over the next two weeks, we'll come back and we'll fill in kind of the idea of, 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 of vision and, and strategy and how we, I believe God wants us to go into the world to restore priceless works of art. He starts out and he says, there was the man. The man is a Christian. The man is a disciple. The man is, if you're a disciple, you are a disciple maker. 
If you're a disciple maker, you're also called to be a church planter. No, not necessarily go and start a whole brand new church, but rather that when you as a disciple make a disciple and you make a second disciple, that you bring those disciples into a community. So because the church, we're not called to be in anonymity. We're called to be in community. And what's scary to me, to be honest with you, are the number of churches, so many churches growing, thriving They look like from the outside, people going, oh, look at this great church. Look at all the people that are coming to it. But the problem is there's anonymity at the basis of that church and not community at the basis of that church. And I promise you, based on the authority of God's word, you were not called to come to sit, soak, sour, to consume. You were called to be a part of a community of faith where we gather together and we do life together. We spur one another along toward love and good deeds. And so if you go to a church just to check the box, to consume, but not to engage, then you've missed the point of the body of Christ. You've missed the point. It's not to to get a gold star because you went to church one day. It's to be with other believers, to, to, to gather, to do life, to do mission, to honor and serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords together. And it breaks my heart, the number of churches, that it's not about being in community. It's about having people show up. I don't want to be a church where people show up. And check the box. I want to be in a church where people love each other and care about each other. And they pour their lives into each other. And they hold each other accountable. And they spur one another along toward love and good deeds. But we need to understand that we're fighting not just against a pagan culture. We're fighting against a Christian culture today that is going opposite of the heart of God and the heart of God's word. Which means we have to be that much more diligent to engage and to do life with each other. Let me go and and explain this. So you have first the field. Then you have the sowing or the sharing. You have the seed. Then you have the ministry of nurturing, the ministry of discipling, the ministry of growth. And then finally, you have the ministry of the harvest. I'm gonna go in reverse order very quickly and kind of explain these three things to you, or four things to you, and where we're headed. First is the harvest. The harvest is about community. The harvest is about the commission. The focus is on sharing Christ in community. And, and, and it's, it's, it's to be the church. How do we become the church? We gather together and we do life together. And so there are three essentials that every church must, must have if it's going to do life together. Number one, they have to be in fellowship with each other. What is fellowship? It's not popcorn parties and picnics. Fellowship, the word is koinonia. It's where you engage each other and you do life. Hebrews says you spur one another along toward love and good deeds. It says do not forsake the assembly of the righteous because it's so important that we do life together. Simple reality is is that I need you, you need me, and we all need each other because in this thing called life, in this thing called the Christian life, it sometimes gets tough. And we need people that when we fall down, who'll come alongside and pick us up. We need people who will love us in spite of our mistakes, in spite of who we are. That they love us because we are children of God and because we are in family with them. It's people who say, you know what, I want to attach myself to a group of believers who I'm willing to allow them to speak into my life so that I can be all that God has called me to be. That's koinonia. That's koinonia. Koinonia isn't shaking hands on Sunday and then forgetting about each other the rest of the week. Koinonia is saying, I'm going to be a part of your life. I I use this word in the first service. When you decide to be a part of a fellowship, you're, you're giving people the permission to invade your life. It's just nice when they knock first. But you're giving people permission to engage you. And do life together, no matter how strange they may be, okay? You guys missed the humor of that one, but that's all right. A second thing is accountability. We all need accountability. Out of 
fellowship comes a willingness to have people in your life who can challenge you on those, in those areas of your life where you are not following God, where you're going in the opposite direction. And you give people permission to say, hey, you know what, you probably shouldn't go that direction. And you give them permission to come alongside, and when you're starting to go one way, they grab your arm, and they take you back in the correct direction. We all need accountability. I, I, I believe, and I'm not basing this upon just counseling here, I'm basing this upon all the many years that I've been in doing ministry and all the people that have come that I've counseled with. I would say well over 75% of the people that I've counseled with, if they just had someone in their life to give them accountability, whether it's accountability to be a godly dad, whether it's accountability to be a godly husband, a godly wife, whatever, godly businessman or businesswoman, just give permission to someone to say, why are you doing what you're doing? It doesn't line up with scripture. I promise you 75% of the people that I counsel, I probably would never have to counsel if they just would allow someone to give them real biblical accountability. We all need accountability. And then third is our commission. We are not called as a church to be just a group of people who go and do their own life. We're called to do life together. We're called not just to pray individually, we're called to pray together. We're not called just to go out and share the gospel alone, we're called to share the gospel together. We're not called to study the Bible by ourselves, we're called to study the Bible together. And I believe that's critical that we do life together. That's part of the harvest, that's part of the gathering. The second one is going to the growth the nurturing, discipling. The focus here is on making sure that we're teaching the truth of God with intimacy and maturity. We're, we're making disciples. We're, we're nurturing. We're protecting. You know, there's a reason why farmers put scarecrows in their fields. There's a reason they put pesticides on the plants. It's to protect them. It's to nurture them. It's to make sure they grow to maturity where they, have, they, they can produce a fruit. They can produce a crop. And the same thing's true in, in, in the whole discipling process. We have a responsibility to help every one of us in this room to grow to maturity. Hebrews says, I want you to get off the milk so that you get to the meat. I want you to grow up so you can stand on your own two feet for Christ. And I think to do that, every Christian has to have three things. If they don't have these three things, I don't know that they can stand on their own two feet. And I call these the big three. Number one, you have to Hear the voice of God and know it's God. You've got to be able to distinguish. This is God speaking. If the Christian life is knowing God, hearing his voice, how critical is it that you can, whether it's opening the word or whether someone comes to speak to you, you know it's God speaking to you in that moment. Because see, when God speaks, he leads us. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your steps. That's a promise from God. He wants every one of us to follow him. Not that we move out and say, God, would you put fairy dust blessings on top of me? God, what do you want me to do? The only way you're going to know to do that is to tune your ears to God and be able to distinguish his voice from all the other voices that are surrounding you. And I think it's a critical thing that every one of us know how to distinguish God's voice moment by moment, day by day. A second thing is that we understand what it means to hold in covenant. Covenant is such a huge truth throughout Scripture. Covenant begins way back in the Old Testament, and it, and it still applies today. We are in the covenant of God's grace. And why it's so critical is because we don't just learn about who God is and what he has done for us, but we learn about who we are in Christ. Most, I, I've been around too many Christians. It looks like they've been weaned on pickle juice. I mean, they're all all sucked up. I mean, it's, 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 it's depressing. There's no life. There's no joy. They're just, they're, it's like life has just beaten the living daylights out of them. And the reality is, that's not truth. Do you realize who you are in Christ? You are in this covenant relationship with the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He has put his Holy Spirit inside of you. He has given you life. He has given you victory. He has given himself to you. That is who you are. 
And yet so many of us, we walk through life having no concept of who we are in Christ. And because of that, we get beat up every single day. And that doesn't have to happen. It doesn't mean life's not going to be tough. It doesn't mean you're not going to have ups and downs. But you can walk through everything. You can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But because of who you are in Christ, you do not have to live defeated. And that's part of covenant to know who you are can make all the difference. All the difference. And then third, we have, to, we have to make sure that we know how to rightly divide the word of truth. We need to know how to handle this. We need to realize that this is the breath of God. This is God speaking to you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He wants to help you understand not just who he is, but who you are and who he's called you to be. And this is found in the living, active word of God. But too many of us, we have no concept how to handle this. We don't know how to pick it up and to study it or, 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 or to, to, to dissect it so that we can grasp the principles and the precepts of God and we can apply them to our lives. All through Scripture, the, the, the Bible tells us how to study it, why to study it. And yet, so many of us, Christianity in general, we have no concept of how to handle the Bible. Some of us are just terrified of it. We have almost like a, kindergarten's, a kindergartner's idea of how to interpret Scripture. And you know what, folks? It shows up in our lives. But when we understand and when we can hear God's voice and we understand who we are in Christ and then we can rightly divide this, we can live powerful Christian lives that make an eternal difference and an earthly difference. And I think that's part of the nurturing and the discipling that we've got to go through. Then you have the seed, the sowing of the gospel. How do we share? How do we, how do we go and gospel? How do we engage the world? How do we use our, our voices? How do we use our hands? How do we use our feet to engage the world around us? Whether it's at work, whether it's at play, wherever we are on a mission trip, how do we go and share the hope that's within us? Because this is, this is at the core of what it means to be Christian. We're little Christ. We're representatives of Christ in this world. And all through the scripture, we're told, follow him, we'll make fishers of men. And so we need to talk about how do we do that? How do we engage? How are we going to engage as a church? And I want to present to you, and I'll, I'll go into this in much greater detail in a couple of weeks. I call it the any three mindset. Anywhere, at any time, to anyone who God calls me to talk to. Just this weekend. <laughs> We had almost a, a bad joke at our house. We had a Jewish family, a Catholic family, a non-Christian family, a guy who was atheist, and then we had a, uh, uh, a couple other Christian families at our house. And I was looking out, and I thought, this is crazy. We have all these people. And yet I'm looking going, I have a responsibility to be Jesus to them. And I listened as I, as as. Christian families and Jewish families and, and, and non-Christian families, they discussed, and they discussed one thing in common that broke my heart. It was how non-Christian, so many people who call themselves Christians, behave. This one family looked at me because I don't know why I would even be interested in Jesus because everybody I know who, who says they follow Jesus, there's nothing about Jesus in their lives. This is what it means to share. We have to look and we have to say, God is my life. Does it match my words? Well, I could go way off there, so let me just not do that. Then the last area is the ministry of the field. And folks, this is the most important issue. Remember that? Remember the seeds earlier? Some seed fell upon the trampled path. Some seed fell upon the rocky ground. Some seed fell among the weeds. We are called to prepare the field. How do you prepare the field of someone's heart? It's through prayer. 
You remember in the scriptures where Jesus comes along and he says, disciples, I want you to go out and do things in my name. And they go out the first time and they come back like, woohoo, man, this was awesome. We were kicking tail. I don't know if I could say that or not, but sorry if I offended anybody. I didn't mean to. They, they, I mean, they went out and they were coming back going, man, this miracle happened and this happened and this happened. They were like, man, this was awesome. And then he sends them out a second time. You know what happened the second time? They came back with their tails between their legs. They came back because they had gotten whooped. They ran to a demon and that demon cleaned them up. And they came back to Jesus and said, what in the world happened? And Jesus looks and says, some things can only be accomplished by prayer and fasting. Folks, we're talking about the miracle of someone's life that's going the opposite direction of God. It has no hope. It's depraved. The greatest miracle in all the world is when a lost person is found, when a dead person comes to life, and it's all because of the power of God. It's not, it has nothing to do with us. It's God moving upon them. We're the vehicles, the vessels that God uses. And where we begin is we begin in prayer because someone has to break up the fallow ground. Someone has to take this, this rocky ground and turn it over so that it's receptive, ready to receive the word of God. You know, a year and a half ago, we built a house. We're pretty happy with the house except for the plants. I don't know who plants... How, who plants at these, at these homes? But what I found is this. I can go to any, I've been in my house for a year and a half. I can go to any plant that was planted by the builder and I can go over and pull it straight out and it's still got the, it's like it just came out of the pot. They built a hole, they, they dug a hole about like that big and stuffed the plant down in there and that plant's going, uh, uh, I mean, it's struggling. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been digging them, I've been digging them up and I've, I'm built, I'm putting holes like three to four times the size, three to four times as deep. I'm putting good soil around them. And like all of a sudden, my, my plants are going like, hey, this is great. Uh, one of our church members in the first hour, they reminded me, they said, you, you buy a dollar plant, excuse me, you buy a 25 cent plant and you, and you dig a dollar hole, okay? That's not what they did. They bought a $10 plant and, and put like a penny hole, you know? Why is that important? Because we are called through prayer, through our lives, through our witness. We're called to prepare the ground of people's lives. That's what we have to be about as a church. We've got to be about preparing the ground, preparing the, for the way of the Lord to work in our lives. We're not called to convince people, to convict people, to convert people. But we are called when the Spirit of God charges us, which is often when your ears are tuned to him, by the way, to convey it. Not confrontationally, relationally. And so it's to this that I wanted you to see the biblical basis of why I'm going to lay out what we're going to lay out because we're looking at how can we Get away from being a program church to be a church that's focused on people. That's centered not on giving people another Bible study, but rather giving them what they need in order to walk in God's word day by day, minute by minute. And so here's what I ask you to do. I'm asking you to begin praying. I'm praying that God would open your heart and your mind and your eyes, because for some of us, he's going to need to detox us. We have been churched so long that we need God to turn our lives upside down so that we're open to the moving of God instead of the traditions of our religion. And so I want to ask you to pray with me. I want to ask you to pray for our staff because we're still navigating. We don't have a full picture. But we have enough to begin the journey. And I want to ask you to join us. I believe God has great things that he wants to do in, through, and among us. But it's going to require us to have a spirit, a posture that says, yes. Yes, Lord, 
I'm in. There will be sacrifice. There will be surrender. Not to the church, to the cause of Christ. For some, it means re-engaging. For others, it means engaging for the first time. But I want to ask you to join, and let's see what God could do. Wouldn't you, for just one time in your life, like to be a part of something in the kingdom of God that you can step back and you say, I have no idea. All I can say is God moved. It wasn't because of the will of man, the plans of men. It was because God showed up, and we said yes, and he did things that we can't begin to ask or imagine. Let's pray. Thanks, Father, for our time today. Lord, I know we've gone over, but I really believe, Lord, that you have something for us. So, Lord, as we enter into our invitation, Lord, I, I, I open up the altars and ask our church to come and to seek you or to sit down where they're sitting and just seek you. But, Lord, I believe that you want to do something in and among us. And I can hardly wait to see if we'll just be obedient. Would you stand with me? If God, you feel God's calling you to be a part of our church, or if you want to come and pray in these altars, pray with me about what's happening. I invite you to come. If you'd like to talk to someone about your relationship with Jesus, our altars are open. Let's pray.